Good morning, folks. It's SDO Calibration Day, keeping the satellite focused and centered. We're going to hit key items in three of our four core topics today, climate, cosmology, and catastrophism. Let's go to spaceweathernews.com and we find the last day on our star, well, after the calibration anyway, was a picturesquely calm scene. Filaments are less active, sunspots regrouping below the surface after their run last week. Solar wind began its return up out of anemically quiet range. The climb into another coronal hole streams appears only moderately turbulent as geomagnetic conditions remain calm and quiet this morning. So folks, prepare to see this around the net today. I will let Tony Heller debunk the actual temperatures recorded while we play devil's advocate and let them cheat. Not hard to make global warming look scary when you scale out the colder areas which are on their departure maps here. News will not be showing this one. But they may be quoting the scientists and saying no part of the world had record cold. And that's true if you look at the average temperatures, but if you look at how hot it got during the day, which is really what global warming is supposed to be about, then yes, it was a less impressive show. And regions like the Midwest of the U.S. did have their coldest, along with a few others across the world. There is also the focus on the layers of the atmosphere that are lower, the heat trapping, the lag forcing. The temperatures they are seeing are housed within that lower atmosphere, and that makes sense. But of course, there is much more atmosphere above. Perfectly riding the sunspot cycle, the thermosphere is what has a 1 to 10 year lag in terms of lower atmosphere forcing, and which also has a 20 to 85 year lag coming back out of the oceans. When the thermosphere is above neutral, we will get warming for the next few years barring other factors like volcanoes. And when the sun drops out, it's a year or more before that signal of colder temperatures descends. As we've mentioned before, warming forcing from the sun ended in 2005, and we're creeping closer to that 20-year mark of the forcing from the oceans, let alone the longer one. This comes as the sun is due for grand solar minimum this century and drastic cooler forcing signals for decades. By the way, not only were these high cycles of activity on the chart the grand solar maximum of the last 11,000 years, but volcanic cooling has been at record low. Don't fall for claims to the contrary online these days, by the way, and indeed we'll try to get you out a video tonight on those volcanoes and earthquakes, but for now, the climate videos linked below show not only those facts we were discussing and those lags and those forcings, but also the way that professors and the UN are quietly changing the game already. It is one of the most exciting stories on Earth right now if you're a contrarian, dissident, or you just like a good fight. So sometimes the sun refuses to obey its cycle. This is from 1903. During the minimum phase of a relatively weak solar cycle, we had magnetometer deviations worldwide, auroral sightings, and it has been rescued from the records. This is one I hadn't heard of before, and it fills a critical gap in major storms from the sun. In the 20 to 30 year extreme event recurrent cycle, we were missing the turn of the century. Not anymore. Oddly enough, things like plasma turbulence and accretion driven nova events are much more powerful than flares, and yet they're always the product of low activity. Like the dimming of a star, like Betelgeuse is now, and by the way, 600 light years away doesn't scare us even if it does go nova in our lifetimes. The solar wind expel failure and accumulation on the coronal shell to release when too much pressure is built inside, yeah, that's a low activity scenario, not a high one. This would be the effects of hitting the over density and electromagnetic reversal of the galactic current sheet, for example, which we believe also triggered Proxima Centauri some years ago. The videos on the solar micronova and cosmic level disaster are also linked below. But we also have a fun aesthetic look at Proxima b, the exoplanet orbiting that flare star Proxima Centauri, and an interesting use of resources here. Don't get me wrong, it's pretty, but I'm not sure what anyone does with a wind map simulation of a tidally locked exoplanet we don't know the composition of, nor do I know what to do with the pretend Earth tidally locked at the sun from the Pacific. That is our tax money. Sort of bridging cosmology and catastrophism here, we discussed the gamma nodes in the mid-plane sheet, and they're seeing many more of those now. But often, they're associated with type 1 X-ray bursts, hinting that they're from pulsars. And recall, type 1 X-ray bursts are the really micro micronova, or maybe even nanonova, considering the shell release would barely make it to Venus if it happened here. Of course, the source of the galactic sheet is the nucleus, the center of the galaxy where they've now spotted four more G objects. We've now got G1 through G6, and while they appear distended and blobby, they act like stars. 
for a deeper dive into that one, we're going to have to wait for the follow-up to the Plasma Cosmology movie, which is linked for you below. But such a key thing to grasp before trying this one is that these G objects may be a key portion of the interior torus and surrounding features. Their existence was more than puzzling upon the first two discovered, and now they've got four more. Best of luck, astronomy. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here, but right now, it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.